doctors share their best med school advice. I asked different medical specialists what was the best advice that they got while they were in med school. For me, it was a simple piece of advice that hit the nail right on the head. If you can't teach it, you don't know it. It's so easy for us to see a concept, think we know the concept, and only realize that we don't know the concept as well as we think we do once we try explaining it to another person because then it highlights the gaps in our knowledge. So I like that one a lot. And that's why I use the Feynman technique so frequently in med school in these small group study sessions. And you can learn how to use it yourself with this video right up here. Hi, I'm Dr. Siobhan Deshauer. Although online, you may know me as Violin MD. I'm a rheumatologist, so I specialize in joints and autoimmune diseases. In medical school, our dean was giving us a speech, and I remember when he told us that the most dangerous doctors were the ones who don't know what they don't know. Dunning-Kruger, baby! At the time, I didn't really realize how important that was, but it's actually still a concept that I think about to this day. Because, you know, in pop culture, there's this fantasy of the doctor who knows everything. And against all odds, they'll always solve the mystery and save the patient. But the truth is, over 5,000 medical articles are published every day. So it's literally impossible to know everything. So that's why it's so important to stay humble, know your limits, and know when to get other experts involved. Imagine a pie chart. Tiny sliver of what we know, we know. Another tiny sliver of what we know, we don't know. Most of the pie chart, we don't know what we don't know. And one place you'll see this heavily debated in medicine is with regards to mid-levels having independent practice rights because mid-levels, NPs and PAs, are often at that earlier stage on the Dunning-Kruger curve where they overestimate their level of competence. They have a high degree of confidence, but a lower degree of competence because, plain and simple, becoming an NP or a PA is not as extensive of training compared to becoming a physician in a given specialty. My name is Jake Goodman, and I'm in my last year of psychiatry residency. The best piece of advice I ever received in medical school was treat the patient, not the disease. That's very fitting for psychiatry especially, but I think it applies to all specialties. I cannot tell you how powerful this is, and I use this mindset when I'm treating any patient. I'm a mental health doctor, so I ask all of my patients the same question. I ask them, what brings you joy in your life? And for some people, it's cooking or running or hanging out with their grandkids. I try to incorporate that into their treatment plan. That is treating the patient, not the disease. And in no textbook is it going to tell you to do that. But from my experience, it really worked. Another example of this in a non-psychiatry setting would be if you understand what the patient's disease process is and how to treat it, oftentimes it's not a matter of just telling them what it is, how to fix it, boom, done, you're out. It's about trying to figure out what their understanding of the disease is, educating them, and even doing some motivational interviewing to see what kind of behavior change you can elicit from them that aligns with improving their health. I'm Dr. Gary Linkov. I'm an ENT specialist with subspecializations in facial plastics and hair restoration surgery. The best advice that I got during medical school was to have work-life balance. Life never gets easier and we'll always have lots on our plate and the more advanced we get in our careers, in many ways, the harder it gets, the more pressure there is. I can already hear the pre-meds, med students, residents being like, what? It never gets easier. Look, what I'll say is that there are some biases that us as humans have. We tend to look back and underestimate the difficulty of things. And it's very important for us to try to counter that bias. Most of my colleagues, most of my friends who are attending physicians will say that it is, sure, certain things are harder about it in terms of like the added responsibility. Now you have to support your family because you're older now, you know, additional things on your plate. But in terms of the hours worked or the intensity, these things can vary based on your specialty, your practice setting, and usually it's going to be getting easier. So if you are a trainee, don't worry, hang in there. Many things will be getting easier and there's seasons to this. There's going to be hard and easier times during pre-med, hard and easier times during med school, hard and easier times during residency as part of the process. There will also be hard and easier times as an attending. It's very important to find that work-life balance and to continue to do things with our friends and family and to still entertain our hobbies and to not just work all the time. That's good advice because paradoxically, you actually become more effective, get more stuff done, um, greater results in whatever professional pursuits and academic pursuits you may have when you have that better balance because when you are coming at it recharged and from a place of operating near capacity rather than being burnt out, you're both enjoying life and getting better results. Why would you not 
prioritize work-life balance. And I would argue if it's because you don't have enough time, it's likely because you haven't honed your time management techniques to the point where you can have that work-life balance. Hi, my name is Dr. Alok Patel. I'm a pediatric hospitalist. If a child is hospitalized, my people are on it. I was fortunate to have a lot of pearls of wisdom given to me in medical school. There are two that stick out to me. If you ever order a lab imaging or a test, you better be able to defend it and explain what you're going to do differently with the results or don't order it because it's not needed. Yes. And this is how you avoid over testing. If you're testing everything, you're going to find some things that may be irregular out of normal range. But if they're not relevant or helpful to the current situation, then it's essentially wasted money, wasted effort and distractions pulling you in other directions from what the actual issue is. A quick rudimentary example to drive this point home. If you got an MRI of the spine of every single person in America, you would find a very significant portion of people who had significant findings on their MRI. They'd have degenerative disc disease, you know, disc bulges and herniations and such, but they would be asymptomatic. No back pain. Does that mean you should intervene? Should they get involved in PT immediately and possibly even undergo surgery? Obviously not. Although you could make the justification for the PT to avoid further degeneration. And number two, always attempt to meet patients where they are, not where you want them to be. And that goes back to the whole point on treating patients as people, not diseases. My name is Dr. Anthony Yoon, and I'm a board certified plastic surgeon. I'm a YouTuber and a podcaster. I had a plastic surgeon mentor always tell me that you never regret plastic surgery you didn't do, you only regret the plastic surgery that you did that you never should have. So in my practice, I firmly believe in using plastic surgery only as a last resort. If people ask me, Dr. Yoon, if I get plastic surgery, if I go under the knife under general anesthesia, what's the worst thing that can happen to me? I tell them that you can die. So always, always, always use surgery as a last resort. Sometimes it's your best option, but if there are other options available, in general, it may be worthwhile to try those first. I love that, man. They, they often recommend you don't ask your barber if you need a haircut because they're incentivized to say yes. And similarly, you oftentimes don't want to go straight to the orthopedic surgeon anytime you have a back injury or some back pain because they may recommend that you get surgery when PT or other things may be uh, better warranted. And with any procedure, there's this informed consent process. But I think a lot of patients, it kind of just glosses over like, oh, yeah, of course, infection and this and losing my limb and yada, yada, yada. These are all just risks that are not going to happen to me. It's like, well, these are risks that they're called risks because they can and do happen to a certain subset of patients every single year. Hi, I'm Dr. Rina Malik, urologist and pelvic surgeon. The best piece of advice I got from medical school is you can do anything for a few weeks. Now, in third year medical school, we do rotation. So we'll do four weeks of neurology, 12 weeks of medicine, 12 weeks of surgery. And very often, if you had somebody who maybe you didn't get along with or you didn't enjoy the work you were doing, it was just a short period of time. So you could get through anything. And I've certainly used that sort of knowledge to my advantage when I've been faced with difficult challenges in my life. Oftentimes we feel like negative emotions are going to last forever when in reality they're just as temporary as positive emotions. And that's such a great reminder, especially in med school when you're rotating through different things every month or two. Yes, some rotations will suck more than others, but you can do just about anything for a few weeks. I love that. Hi, my name is Ben Schmidt, also known as Doc Schmidt, and I'm a gastroenterologist, also known as a GI doctor. One of my attendings told me there's nothing more dangerous than a differential diagnosis of one. A differential diagnosis is basically the list of possibilities that doctors come up with for a patient's symptom or set of symptoms. So if you come in with diarrhea, my differential diagnosis would include food poisoning, Crohn's disease, IBS, celiac disease, etc. The questions I ask, the tests I order, and procedures I do can help clarify which one of those is causing your diarrhea. But if you only have one disease on your list from the start, you're going to get tunnel vision and only do tests looking to fit in with that specific diagnosis, and you'll risk missing the actual diagnosis. Great point and a core reason as to why early on in med school, even in your first year, they're going to drive home this idea of differential diagnosis, keeping a, keeping a broad differential diagnosis, and then eliciting other pieces of data from the physical exam, the history, uh, labs, and imaging to then narrow down that differential. But yes, always a broad differential to start. Hello, my name is Mauricio, but everybody calls me Dr. Mao. I'm triple board certified in internal, emergency, and obesity medicine. My physiology teacher used to say, the eyes will never see what the mind doesn't know. I like that. I like that saying a lot. And it actually reminds me from back in my neuroscience days of top down processing, where your brain uses existing knowledge and experiences and expectations to then make sense of the sensory input that's coming in. So it's top down rather than bottom up. And obviously, it applies to learning. I think maybe Dr. Mao is uh, meaning it more in that learning sense that 
once you understand a concept, you start noticing related details that were previously invisible to you. So a doctor might pick up on certain signs and symptoms in a patient and then make a diagnosis that a less experienced doctor or even another healthcare worker, actually my girlfriend who's a nurse was just telling me a story of a patient literally yesterday who had a hemorrhagic stroke that people did not notice until the next day after she came into the ED, which is wild. And this is a reminder of both the Dunning-Kruger effect that we talked about earlier and the importance of just constantly brushing up on your knowledge. And even when it comes to something like cars and driving, the eyes will never see what the mind does not know until you have the, the experience, the skills set, the knowledge of understanding, understeer, oversteer, steering feedback, load up, chassis suspension and damping tuning and how the chassis can load up mid corner and how it can rotate with trail braking, all those things. You won't appreciate how certain cars drive differently than other cars. Dude, sometimes I'm embarrassed that how often I try to fit in car analogies where they may not be the best option. But for those who are interested, you know, car channel right up there. Hey everyone, my name is Dr. Sanjay Janeja and I'm a hematologist and medical oncologist, otherwise known as a blood and cancer specialist. The best piece of advice I learned in med school was basically be wary with certainty. And what that means is that medicine is very humbling. Things that we are sure this is how it works or, or you know, surely this makes sense as we understand it. We've been told, wait, maybe it's not that simple or actually the opposite happens. So for that reason, be wary of certainty, not only when you're hearing it from other places that this is never possible or always, but also internally when I find myself being overly certain or saying something kind of automated, I make sure to reinvestigate and see if anything is new. And that's what kind of keeps you adept, but also so humble and continue to grow and foster what you've learned, which always could be incorrect over time. Dude, that's great. It's it's uh, it reminds me of two concepts. One is have strong opinions, but loosely hold them. So that means be willing to change your mind with new data and new insights that come about. And the other thing is that they say 50% of what you were taught in med school is wrong. There's going to be new science, new literature, new data to suggest something completely different and to disprove what you learned in med school. The hard part is knowing what that 50% is, because you simply won't until a future date. Hi, I'm Dr. Glockin Flecken. I am actually a board certified ophthalmologist. Best piece of advice I got from my medical education is the only way to avoid surgical complications is to not operate. Yep, just like we were talking about before, there's always that risk. That was fun, guys. What do you think? Leave a comment below.